Well, thanks everyone for joining us today for Hydroterra's first webinar of 2024. It's uh, great to see so many registrants today and uh, thanks very much for your continued interest. Today we have a topic which is uh, close to my heart, really. It's all about contaminated land. The title being Decoding 13 Years of Audits unveiling health risks from contaminated land and its implications for policy, research and practice. I guess one could paraphrase that and say, we're doing a lot of work in contaminated land. How well is that work working and how important is it? Today's presenter is Dr. Victor Kabai. Kabai, correct, yes. Okay, thank you, Victor. You've got to stay out of this stage. <laughs> so, Victor, I will introduce more formally and give a background in a second. Before that, I'd like to acknowledge, I'd start by, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land and for that privilege, we would like to thank the traditional owners Hydroterra respectfully acknowledges the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, where we are located today, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. There's a picture of Victor. So a little bit about Victor. He's an environmental risk management specialist with over 20 years experience consulting uh, his state government, industry and academia. He currently works as a national senior environmental advisor for CleanAway and has been recently made a fellow of the University of Melbourne in acknowledgement for his ongoing support of the university and in particular CAPM, which stands for the Centre for Anthropogenic Pollution, Impact and Management. Some of you would have seen Susie Reichman's talk last year, which took out the prize for the most attendees. A few more things about Victor that I've just uh, learned from him. He did his undergrad, his master's and his PhD all at the University of Melbourne. Uh, he's had a strong focus on gas works and contamination associated with them. He was for five years the Principal of Public Health at the Victorian EPA, and he is currently a Senior Environmental Advisor with CleanAway, focusing on risk management frameworks and incident management. So really lucky to have you here today, Victor, and thanks very much. Before we charge into things, just to remind you that we have a desire for you to ask lots of questions. And in order for you to do that during the presentation, please use the Q&A button at the top of your screen. It's a really important part of these webinars. Why does Hydroterra do these webinars? We believe in sharing knowledge. We like to facilitate education and we like to take a leadership role in industry. So without further ado, I'd like to pass over to Victor. Excellent. Thank you very much, Richard, and thank you everyone for having me. Um, before we start, I just want to very quickly thank, uh, you know, obviously CleanAway have been and continue to be wonderfully supportive of all of the quirky work I do outside of my role at CleanAway when I volunteer for the university, and I really want to thank them for that. And everything I'm saying and doing today is really with my Melbourne University hat on, all right? So it really doesn't represent anything at the cleaner way, and it is very much as a, as a fellow of the Melbourne University. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, what we're presenting today, or what you will be hearing from me today, is it's all published in a, quite a recent paper, which you can see there in the, on the right of the screen. And I obviously have to acknowledge my two absolutely wonderful co-authors, 
uh, being Claire Papaleo, who works at WSP, and she's a brilliant risk assessor and fantastic statistician. Anyone who has worked with the, with her knows, and she's one of the only people I know who's actually passionate about statistics and enjoys it. And, and of course, the magnificent Susie Reichman, who is the director of the CAPM and is uh, has been a colleague for many years and a wonderful person and a brilliant co-author. So I thank them for both very much. So what, what is this piece of research you're going to hear about today? It, it, it came as an unusual idea from me. It was to look at many years of audit reports from Victoria and, and try and extract risk data from these audits. And, you know, these audits, they, they just tend to sit somewhere, right? And we said, no, 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 let's actually go back and look at what they found in terms of human health risks and actually look at all the results together and try to see what they could tell us about the risks posed to human health by contaminated land overall and also really help us understand about the machinery of how contaminated land is managed. What is the risk framework in Australia for how contaminated land is managed? So if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, basically, you know, it, it was an it was an ordeal, and actually, um, it, this this project got me through COVID because it was, when you're reviewing one thousand seven hundred and sixty four audit reports, um, you know, it's great to be sitting on the couch at home and uh, and not being outside. So this this project was it was a little bit of a COVID project, and it definitely did its job from that perspective. Um, one thing I will say, by the way, for obviously there's many people in the room who are not from Victoria. Um, obviously, Victoria has a, a contaminated land audit framework. They've had it for many, many years. And actually, most or all states in Australia have something comparable. The, the reality is, even though the results um, that I will be presenting today come from Victorian audits, chances are the, they're broadly applicable at almost all states in Australia or generally applicable everywhere throughout Australia and probably in most similar countries. So what have we been really looking for in, in, in these audit reports? So sure, we review 1,732 audit reports. We did not extract the concentration of every pollutant from every report. No, we did not do that. What I was really looking for was any audit report that had a health, a human health risk assessment component to it, whether it was done by the auditor itself or whether it was one of the appended documents in one of the appendices to the audit. So for those of you who are not familiar, human health risk assessment reports are, are, are basically an evaluation of, you know, they take into account everything, right? All of the source pathway, receptor pathways are considered, um, various uh, phases, whether it's liquid, solid, gaseous. They look at all of the data holistically. They look at all of the human receptors holistically, and they try to provide um, relatively objective, and we'll talk about it, risk metrics to evaluate the risk posed by the site as it is, or as it would be after some sort of remediation. So in searching for these health risk assessment reports from the audits, we extracted that in total out of the 1,000, however many it was, it, they ended up being 376 human health risk assessments that we could review in detail. Next slide, please. And so let's look at first, for the first graph, we go straight into the results because we, why not? I mean, the results are the fun part, right? So we're looking at this, these 13 years of data, and uh, let's look at how many audits were done and how many of them had a risk assessment at all. This graph is mostly interesting to risk assessors, and it tells you something about the state of the industry more in general. So, and please, just for anyone out of state, from, from out of state, please remember in Victoria, the Contem land audits and the facilities audits, as they were called, are treated differently which is why you can see that little peak in 2014. Can you see that not contaminated land audit peaks up? That's a false peak. Please don't treat it as a real peak. That is just because that is the year when EPA uploaded them all onto the system, <laughs> right? So that's when they started uploading them. Before then, there were a facilities audits or non-contaminated land audits, but they were not uploaded onto the system. Really, 
there isn't that much of a pattern in this graph, but there are two stories that I'd like to tell. One is there is a slight peak a couple of years after the new Nephim came out in the audits. Whether that's you know um, a causal link or not is a little bit hard to tell, but it's an interesting one to point out. And the second one, the one that I'm most interested in, is that about 30-ish percent, 35% of audits have a human health risk assessment component to them. And that hasn't changed through time. It's, I mean, of course, it goes up and down a little bit, but it's basically always been the same. This is actually quite a surprising finding. I thought that with the new NEPM coming out and with the, all the focus on risk assessment, that that number would have ramped up. Well, it didn't. It's essentially the same the whole way through. Next slide, please. So let, let's think about it for a second, okay? When, when does someone even do a health risk assessment, right? A health risk assessment, there's a million situations when you do one, let's be honest. So I can't tell you the full picture. I will just tell you some of the main ones. Usually, it's when you've got a pollutant or more than one pollutant that is present and it's detected at concentrations that are pretty high and definitely higher than the guideline values that are present in the NEPM or in other guidelines, the screening level guidelines you apply as your starting point. So if you've got arsenic in the soil, that's fine. There's arsenic in almost every soil. But how much is there? Oh, there's levels that are above the screening level guidelines. All right, we probably should do a health risk assessment especially if it's the site is proposed to be reused for quite a sensitive reuse and, and or there is a plausible um, exposure pathway to a sensitive human receptor. I suppose the second use of health risk assessments really is when there are no guideline values at all. So for example, when there is a pollutant that, that for which there are no screening values. Of course, and I forgot to list it in there, there is a third major use that is when, when you're trying to remediate a site and you're defining your remediation targets, that's normally done through a health risk assessment. Now, the, the lines below are a bit of a caveat because of course I can't not have caveats. You will see we're looking at data out of human health risk assessments. It's not a, what you would call a clean data set. It's an empirical data set. It is, it's the function of a lot of things, okay? So, for example, if a pollutant is very expensive to analyze, you might not have analyzed for it, so you wouldn't have detected it, and so you wouldn't have known to do a risk assessment of it, right? And that's dioxins. For anyone in the room, that's the example, because they cost, well, back when I worked in Quantum Land, they were about $1,000 a pop for analysis. So... That's one. You know, there also, there might be situations where the screening level is so conservative that you exceed it all the time. And so you're just going to carry out a lot of risk assessments to actually try and evaluate the risk. You might have some situations where the screening level is not very conservative at all. And so you actually, you, you will almost never have to carry out a risk assessment on it. So, so you can understand what I'm trying to say here. This is not, it's not just a simple metric where everyone assesses health risk in exactly the same way. And it's a nice, cold, hard data set, but it still can teach us a lot about contaminated land. Next slide. So one of the objectives of this piece of work was really to try and guide planning policy, right? And it was to understand you know, what are the historical uses of land that are most likely to result, to, to create a human health risk that is notable? And there's many ways you can look at it. So one way of looking at it is simply black and white. Of all the principal contaminating activities, that's what we're calling them, which are the ones that need the health risk assessment most often? Remembering what I said before, when do you need a health risk assessment? When there is going to be a sensitive receptor on the site and when you've got a pollutant that's exceeding some level that triggers an initial red light, that it might be an amber light, that it may be of concern. So if you look at the top six, so next slide. Um, if you look at the top six there, they are an interesting indicator of sites of principal contaminating activities that happen often 
are often polluted and often have pollution levels that exceed guideline values, right? And that's a way of looking at it. So I would say, and are often redeveloped for sensitive uses. So it's actually quite an interesting way of looking at it. And it's quite a plausible way of looking at important principal contaminating activities. Service stations, shouldn't be a big surprise to anyone who works in contam land, service stations are way on top. Why is it? You know, they are they're surrounded by houses literally next door. They've they've almost always got a plume and it almost always moves underneath the residential land nearby. And there is a vapor risk that creates a potentially complete exposure pathway. Filling. For those of you who are not familiar, by that I mean whenever you build a house, you need to like set the foundations, you need to, you know create a nice flat ground. And what you often do is you often get fill from somewhere else to do it. And historically, people were not that great at checking how clean the fill was before putting it in. In fact, they often use gas works waste as fill, which means there was a lot of lead and a lot of polyaromatic hydrocarbons and other things. We will talk about unknown sources more a little bit later, especially if we've got time. But so it, it seems weird to have unknown in here, but you will see what we mean. And then, of course, there is gas works, automotive repair, and chemical manufacturing. And, of course, all the other ones. You know, it's, it's not a black or white. It's a sliding scale. So if we look at the PCS, this graph, don't get too excited about it. I'm presenting it literally to show there is no pattern. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, if you find one, by all means, let me know. But there, there really, really isn't. Um, so what this is trying to show is you would have thought that there would have been a peak, for example, in service station uh, assessments earlier on, and it would have come down through time as they were slowly getting closed down. That hasn't happened. Um, there is literally no pattern in uh, a temporal trend in which pri principal contaminating activities were assessed more often. Next slide. Now, let's look at a different way of looking at risk, okay? So the first one was just a way, it's an approach. But let's look at it in a in a different way here. Um, so uh, if we look at, sorry, if we look at the probability that a risk assessment will be required. So basically what I'm saying is if I'm a consultant and I set foot and I'm, I'm, I'm starting an audit on a gas works site, based on the data we've seen so far, there is a 78% chance you will need a risk assessment for it which means there is a 78% chance that it is highly polluted, sensitive receptors nearby, complete exposure pathways, guidelines exceeded, right? I have to be honest, I actually thought it would be closer to 100 with gas work sites, but this is, the, this is the number as it came up. So can you see how this is a different way of looking? I will, I will not give you clean answers. I'm sorry, unfortunately, that's the nature of this research. It just depends on different ways of looking at the same thing. If you define the risk of, of each principal contaminating activity as being the likelihood that you'll need a health risk assessment as part of the audit, then gas works, dry cleaning, and service stations come, um, and let's say an imported fill come out way on top, right? And they make sense. They are, they are polluting activities. They are very, very frequent. They did you notice gas work dry cleaning service stations are all related to vapor risks, often, not always, often. Um, so it's quite a it, it is a significant finding and it is an important one. And anyway, and also for any consultants in the room, this is useful. So you know what you're getting into if you do start an audit on one of these sites. Um, next slide, please. Now, going forward, so there are some um. The, the next analysis is going to be a little bit more intricate. I don't expect anyone in the room, or I don't expect everyone in the room to be a health risk assessor. It's quite a spe specialized little field that some people like myself like dedicate a lot of time to, but no one should be expected to get into that kind of stuff. I will be reporting to you on two health indices that are commonly used in health risk assessments. And for those of you who are not familiar, it's actually useful for you to know. This is how basically all environmental assessments are done, are done using these two things. The first thing is called a hazard index. It's so simple. It basically says, are you above or below a level that is 
in inverted commas, safe. A real risk assessor never uses the word safe, but you know, I'll make an exception today. Um, so, you know, you're drinking drinking water, right? And your levels of cyanide are detectable. Oh God, maybe not cyanide, maybe something less toxic than that, zinc. Uh, uh, you know, there's zinc in drinking water, but it's within the drinking water guideline. If, if it is below the drinking water guideline, you'll have an index that is less than one. If it is about, if it's twice the drinking water guideline, it'll be two. If it is 10 times higher, the hazard index is 10. It's as simple as that. The second one's a bit more complex and I won't go into any detail with it. It's the incremental lifetime cancer risk. This is the, this was what's used throughout the industry. It, 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 every consultant uses this indirectly or indirectly to assess the risk of carcinogens. There is no such thing as just a zero risk of cancer. Every exposure contributes an amount, as however small it is, every exposure to a carcinogen rather. You know, so every time someone walks out in the sun, it slightly increases their chance of melanoma. It's just the way it works, right? And so it looks at this probability and it says, when is it that you've reached a probability that is too high? And in Australia, the official acceptable cancer risk is one in 100,000. So I just thought I'd let you know. So you've got the exposure that you're getting from drinking that water or living on that house or breathing that air is one in 100,000. And if that number seems high, please do remember to compare it against this, the, 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 it's the standard incidence rate, which ends up being about one in three. And I hope. I hope it's okay to share that, but it's it's true. That's that's a basic incidence right for cancer in Australia. So I want to worry too much about the the block points underneath. If we can go to the next slide, and actually two slides, one more slide ahead, if that's okay. Um, this is a big busy slide. Please don't worry about it too much. Okay, this is what I really want to point out to you is that what I've done is I've really pointed it out. I've, I've, I've presented the data here as very low risk, low risk, which is acceptable. Both of those fall within acceptable criteria. And then moderate high, very high, which is, you know, basically, you know, yeah, a little bit above. Um, high means you're 10 times above a safe level and very high means you're at least 100 times above a safe level, right? That's So that's, bad, right? When you're over 100 times, that's pretty bad. Um, of course, there is there's a lot you could dissect here. But ultimately, what, I, what I'd like to really look at is underground tanks are fascinating. They're at the bottom in the middle. Um, that Those ones are very often pose an unacceptable risk. And are we surprised, right? These underground tanks leak and the, they, they create often relatively large uh, uh, underground plumes. But I think it's useful to know, it, not once was it found to have, was this um, use of land or these underground tanks where they found to pose a very high risk, not once. And in just a couple of instances, they were found to cause high. So by which I mean about 10 to 100 times the safe level, which is obviously still not great, but you know, it's still significant. Um, as for mechanical man parts manufacturing and fuel storage depot, why they are interesting is because of their relatively high presence of very high risks. Very high is a big deal, right? And so, you know, it, 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 it tells you something about even after all the assessments have been done, after the risk assessor has refined their assessments and done all of the work that needed to be done, it still ended up with a risk it was a hundred times above acceptable risk. Now, please understand that this was done. These are all the assessments that happened before the audit, which means the audit obviously will have had a recommendation to do the remediation and the remediation would have then had to address those risks. Okay, so please understand exactly the context in which these estimates are provided. It's not like the audit just says, yep, the risk is a hundred times above, we'll see you later and good luck. That's obviously never the outcome of an audit for any of you in the room who perhaps are not familiar with how audits work. So I just thought I'd dissect those three in particular. Obviously we could spend hours on this slide but we, and I've done that, but, but uh, I would not dare to bore you with that. So if we go to the next slide, um, if we look at um, the, it's, it's I suppose a way of um, sort of simplifying the previous slide. If you look at the numbers in orange, 
It is basically what I've done is I've presented if I'm a, an auditor, a consultant, or an assessor, or anyone, and I set foot on a site that used to be a service station, that used to be a gas works site, you know, what is the probability based on the data we have that that has a risk that is unacceptable, by which we mean moderate, high, or very high? That's what unacceptable means. And the ones in orange, and you can see the percentages are presented there in that second column. Uh, the numbers in orange are the top three, right? That's as simple as that. And and um, and what it's showing is, so, you know, if I've got an underground tank, I am close to 60% sure that um, that tank would present an unacceptable risk if I did a risk assessment of it. That's what that's saying, right? So it tells you something again about what are the uses of land, but do you notice they don't quite overlap between different methods? which tells you something about how complicated it is to look at risks from contaminated land. Now, those fuel storage depots and underground tanks and mechanical manufacturers, definitely you could see that there is something there about them potentially posing a, a significant risk to human health. If you look at the column on the far right, those are the three, those are the ones that actually, it's just a, it's a, it's a further breakdown. And these are just the risks that are very high. It's telling you what's the probability that if I set foot on that site and I did a health risk assessment, that it would find a risk that is a hundred times what is an acceptable level of risk, which is a lot. And the fuel storage depots win this dubious uh, award, 30%, right? Which is really quite high if you want to look at it that way. And then you, you can look at the other numbers there. They're, they're there for you to look at. So go to the next slide. This is my qualitative attempt, right? You've seen it, right? We're not comparing apples with apples here. What we've done, it seems like a messy story and maybe in some ways it is, but in actual fact, it tells us a lot about the state of contaminated land in Victoria and frankly in Australia, right? And the risk that it poses to the community. What, you've seen, what you see in this table is me trying to summarize the four methods that I've presented to you before and um, and uh, basically just say in red is the, the one that presented the top risk and then in orange are the ones that are a little bit below it and then in green, the ones below that again. And so you can sort of see, you know, you know, you can, you can say that service stations, gas works, mechanical manufacturing, storage depots, um, they, and to an extent imported fill, are significant in terms of their ability to contaminate land to an extent that will pose a plausible risk to human health, right? That's basically what we're finding here, right? And I think it is, and this is of course within all the caveats that I said earlier, but it's still, it's, it is a very, it is a fascinating finding to me at least in its own way. If you go to the next slide, we look at something quite different. Don't get scared. This is a huge list. And I do not, I will, I, I will now read through every single camera. I'm joking. I, of course I wouldn't. Um, I, <laughs> this is, it is um, for actually for the researchers in the room in particular, but not just for you guys and gals. There is, uh, it's quite an interesting finding about what are the pollutants that get risk assessed most often, right? by which I mean the ones that exceed their guidelines most often, that are found most often, that pose a concern the most often. There's a million reasons why they might be selected, right? But regardless, for whatever reason, a risk assessor came along and said, I need to do a risk assessment about that, <laughs> right? So that's, and there's many reasons why they might do it. So you can see at the very top, right? In the top two, there's no surprises there. They're associated with petroleum, right? Fuel often with diesel and petrol, right? Service stations, but not just, right? And these are common pollutants. Anyone who works in contempt land, you'll see them a thousand times. So it's not that surprising to see them there. And remember, I just thought I'd say, there's many reasons, as I said, why a pollutant would be on this list. And remember I said at the very start, pollutants that have a very conservative screening value will be assessed more often. And that is true, potentially, of some of the pollutants here. So for example, for those of you who work in the industry, 
trichloroethene, which is in that second line, you can sort of see towards the end of that 20 to 30 line, uh, or trichloroethylene as it is known to some, um, that's or it's, or it's its old name. Um, that is a substance for, that's notorious for having a very conservative screening level guideline, the screening guideline value, which is why I was not surprised to see it here. Some would argue benzylapyrene also has a very conservative um, guideline value. And so it's, again, not that surprising to find it here. For, um, we'll talk to researchers in a second, but for any policymakers in the room, like the values that are in gray, or, you know, with the gray highlight on them, they're the ones for which there is no guideline value in the NEPA. It doesn't mean there is no guideline value at all, right? It's often buried somewhere else but there is none in the NEPO. And so it tells you something about what are the pollutants for which industry would love to have a guideline value. <laughs> right? That's exactly what this table says. For the trimethyl benzenes that are very common in fuels, the heavy fraction petroleum hydrocarbons, that's the C34 to 40. There are things like lubricants, there are, there are tars, you know, that sort of thing. They're very, very heavy hydrocarbons. And the trans 1, 2 dichloroethane, which is an old solvent that is often seen in old industrial sites. It was, it was used, it, it, it was frequently found as a solvent. Um, these ones are significant. They are, they are found often, they are risk assessed often, and they don't have a screening level guideline in the NEPM. I should have said, sorry, for those of you in the room who are not familiar, I should have said it, sorry. The NEPM stands for the National Environment Protection Measure, which is the framework that governs all contaminated land assessment for all of Australia. We're really lucky we've got one for all of Australia rather than one in each state, which would have been a lot more annoying uh, or difficult to learn rather. For the, I suppose, more the researchers in the room, um, some of these pollutants don't have guideline values because there isn't enough research on how toxic they are. Right, and so that is something that I'll just raise with you. Like the heavy fraction hydrocarbons is definitely one of them, um, at least that I know of. But there are there are many, many in that list underneath. And this table is found in my paper, which is open source. Anyone can access that paper anytime. Um, so you don't have to buy it or anything crazy like that. Um, so it's just something for you to think of and be aware of. Um, so if we go to the next slide, there's just one... Just before we do, Victor, so you say very conservative screening value, like you yes, the definition there, which is pretty important, right? There's an opinion there. Um, what? Why are you calling them very conservative? Do you not believe? Are they calculated in a different way, or have you assessed the methodology through how they're created, or have they got a different risk? factor that comes into it that's why you believe look it is an opinion right and that is and it's absolutely true you are right and when it comes for example to the chlorinated hydrocarbons even the NEPM recognizes like they're called interim screening values like even the NEPM recognizes in its wording that they are deliberately designed to be extremely conservative and, you know, you know, and of course, it would be possible to go into the detail of exactly why they're conservative. And I would say with those, um, for any of you who work in vapor intrusion, you would know it's the attenuation factor used, which basically looks at how much the vapor dilutes between the sub slab and the inside of the house. And for that, that, that there is a number called the attenuation factor, which is basically one divided by the other. And it is not, it is broadly known that a relatively conservative attenuation factor was used as part of the NEPM. So that is definitely an example of that. I, I might actually, if that's okay, Richard, give an example of a pollutant that's actually the other way around, which is lead. Lead is actually not, where, it's one where the screening level isn't particularly conservative, right? So any good risk assessor knows that they should never uh, do a risk assessment on lead because they will always find the risk that's higher than if they just applied the NEPM, right? And there's there is reasons for that, and it's because um, in Australia, in Victoria at least, or I think in Australia, the acceptable blood, the no, the notifiable 
blood lead level in people has dropped uh, since the publication of the NAPA. We could talk about it for hours. The reality is the risk of lead is exactly the same as it's always been. It's just in Australia, a decision was made to actually drop that level so that the government would receive, would be informed more often of when people have elevated blood lead concentrations. Hmm. I hope that addresses your question, Richard. We'll let it go, Victor, for the moment. Yes, it does to some degree. So just one more question. It's quite a big comprehensive list at the bottom here, but it's maybe 0.0001% of all contaminants out there. Um, do, you, do you really think it's meaningful, right? That Do you think that list actually does truly reflect what compounds are risks or are we kidding ourselves that we have the full suite? This is. Actually, that's a really interesting question. Um, what that list at the bottom does, it doesn't tell you anything about risk. Let's be honest with ourselves. What it does is it tells you what are all the substances, all the substances, for which in this 13-year period, someone wished there was a guideline value or, and there wasn't one, which you can see that's why there are, there's all these gray ones, or there was a guideline value that was exceeded, but very rarely, right? Just once or twice. So that is really what that is saying. That is really about substances that are detected. That is what that is about. So it is hardly a hit list as such. It is about substances that are more infrequent, right? But it doesn't make them unimportant, right? It, it makes it means they're infrequent. They often don't have a guideline value, but at least once, but often more than once, they caused one of the assessors to say, no, we need, that's it. We need to do a full assessment on this because I'm concerned that this might pose a risk, right? So this tells you nothing about frequency, but it tells you there was at least one. <laughs> that's what it tells you. All right. Shall I move to the next slide? Yes, please. Thank you. Now, I would not, I will not go into too much detail into this analysis, um, but what I'll explain is I love multivariate statistics and um, my colleague, Claire Papaleo, who, who works on this paper with me also does. So that, that really helps with doing some dendrograms, which are the graphs you see, which is the graph you see here right now. What we were trying to do and, it, and they achieved to some extent is to cluster the data that we found based on the principal contaminating activities and the pollutants that were found in these principal contaminating activities. So basically what it was trying to find is what are the telltale pollutants, I suppose, for various types of PCAs, principal contaminating activities. And Richard, if you go to the next slide, there is a really obvious example there um, where you can see the first column, if you will, cluster A, is um, a number of audits and 100% of them were on mining and 100% of them were on arsenic. So that told you something about what uh, in Victoria specifically, and those of you from Victoria know what we are talking about. It's from the gold, the old gold mining regions where there is a lot of arsenic in the soil. Um, so where there was historical gold mining. And you can see, right, okay. Um, it tells you something about how mining in Victoria is often associated with arsenic contamination. No surprises there in a Victorian context. We knew that all along, but it's nice when the data shows what you knew anyway. If you go one more ahead to the next slide, the next cluster is what I call the chlorinated cluster, <laughs> right? And so it's really two clusters if you put them together, B and C. And so you can see, you know, if you look at the row at the bottom, there's trichloroethylene, TCE, perchloroethylene, PCE, dichloroethane, DC, you can see all of these, right? And you can see where they occur, right? And you can see that they are sourced by a mechanical parts manufacturer, chemical manufacturer, dry cleaners, no surprise, no surprise, no surprise. And there is a very interesting one in there, unknown. 
unknown, in the vast majority of cases, the unknown principal contaminating activity, when, as in when the auditor literally could not name where the contamination was coming from, was trichloroethylene. Why is that? Trichloroethylene is persistent in groundwater and it will travel long distances, kilometers, right? It was used, it was widespread and it's used in industry until, well, not that long ago, but long enough ago. And it was used in large amounts. So it was literally barrels would fall over, would just go into the ground, right? And, and, and so because of this, it is impossible to trace back the site where it's coming from originally. A lot of auditors are not able to do it. It's just not possible. So this is telling you something about how at most sites, having a bit of a concern, obviously most sites nearish a formal industrial use, let's be clear. You know, if you're in a, in a suburban environment where there's just been houses around you the whole time, there's no need to worry. I would say uh, what this is showing is that chlorinated contamination is, even if you had no inkling that there was any contaminating activity really that near you, and you literally can't even find where it's coming from, it, it's something that can pose a risk at your site. So this really val validates, um, you know, when auditors insist on looking at industrial use is quite a long way away. When auditors insist on doing that groundwater well, that perhaps that was like, why are you doing it? Sometimes it's actually a very good idea to do it. And this really validates that view that some auditors have. If you go to the next, the next slide, sorry. Um, that's what I call the imported fill cluster. Um, so that one is, uh, you know, we talked before about open fill is when people historically, not so much now, would bring in unknowingly contaminated fill as the base of the house, sometimes for the garden, it would go all over the place. And this one has just telltale pollution, right? It is benzoapyrene, lead, naphthalene, benzene, right? The benzoapyrene and lead, they are like, they're a dead giveaway of ash from gas work sites, which is a very, very common. It used to be a really common reuse of ash uh, from gas work sites with just that fill from nearby, from nearby houses because it was seen as a, this is a long time ago, it was seen as an inert material it was relatively safe and they needed to put it somewhere. So that's what they did. Next one, please. So the next one, so this one is the benzene cluster. So this one is, you can see like, well, you know, 50% of this cluster is literally benzene. Found often with um, toluene, ethyl benzene. That's a common pattern, we all know that. And it's obviously mostly from servo stations, right? You can see it. So there's really no great mystery here. Ultimately, this is the surfer cluster, right? Which we expected, we knew it, and we love it. If you go to the next one, the next one, so this one is about heavy hydrocarbons, right? So where, where cluster F is really about the light fraction hydrocarbons, the ones you find in petrol, they move along, they, they move quite quickly, they, they evaporate, they, there's a vapor intrusion risk. This one is really about coal tar. It's about lubricants. And you can see it, right? It's gas works. It's still servo stations. There is lubricants and servo stations, automotive repairs, no surprises there. Can you see that that's very much the pattern that you're seeing here is that you can see how the pollutant is very much relating to the um, principal contaminating activity. In these heavy hydrocarbons, you can really see the the PAH is coming up. You can see the heavy fraction hydrocarbons. You can see the benzoylpyrene. And then if you go to the last slide, uh, the last one is on light hydrocarbons. In reality, this one, again, has quite a lot of benzene, quite a lot of servo station. But this one is a little bit more of a mix than the previous servo station that we found. Um, this one ended up being it, it's an interesting one. This one is actually the most common cluster. And it's just saying it's BTEX, F1, F2, naphthalene. You know, those ones, you always see them together, right? They're so, so, so common, <laughs> right? And this is that cluster that has found all of that, lots of survey stations and lots of other sites where you can find petroleum hydrocarbons quite often. 
So no need, oh, I've already discussed this, so we can skip this slide. So, and this is the last slide of this presentation. So look, I, I really, recommendations is one way of looking at it, but it's really just summarizing the findings. So you can, this piece of research, what it does is it, it provides data to support a lot of things a lot of us already knew, right? And that's a good thing, right? We did not want to find crazy new things. We wanted to be able to give numbers that policymakers, planners would be able to use to justify some of the decisions and some of the improvements that could be made at this at their levels or in the in the in their realms or in their spheres of influence right there's also a lot of information in here that is um, possibly quite useful to consultants who operate in the industry so they know what materials to prepare ahead of time because they know what pollutants are going to come up more often i i think there is you has anyone noticed that PFAS was not in there? Now, there was a reason for that. The, the last pollutant was in, the last audit that we looked at was in 2018. It was before PFAS had well and truly emerged, right? There was a couple in there, but it was not very much. So please do not consider the lack of PFAS. If, if we were to do the assessment now, you just know PFAS would come up in there. You just know it would. But this research still does say something about how researchers, and I really, I beseech all the researchers in the room, emerging contaminants, yes, absolutely. Please keep doing the good work you're doing on emerging contaminants. But I would ask to please not forget the not so sexy pollutants that we perhaps have not addressed enough. I'll, I'll say it a million times, petroleum hydrocarbons have not been studied enough. That's my view. Again, that's very much my opinion. But I, I think, you know, amazing things have been done to derive the very good quality guidelines that we have got now. But they did the best they could with research that was relatively limited, right? And I, I honestly believe that we could do with more research on petroleum hydrocarbons, especially given you've seen how common they are, right? They're everywhere. Um, so, and I think that's it. For the moment, I think that's where I'd like to wrap it up. And um, so thank you. That's, very, that's all, all bit for me. Well, that was excellent. Thanks, Victor. I've got a couple of questions that, that I'd like to ask you before we get into it. Um, <laughs> do you get a? Do you think there's a bias depending on the auditors on which ones actually ask for human health risk assessments? Like, are there some that are sort of addicted to having them? <laughs> I would say those are the ones who are addicted to not having them. I'm joking. That's absolutely not true. Um, <laughs> sorry, I should I should know my audience better than that. Um, Look, there is absolutely, and I, I know that for fact because I looked at I looked at that as part of my analysis. It isn't the same. The use of risk assessments changes between auditors. There's a different reliance on them. And that's not that surprising, right? Everyone has their favorite tools that they use to do their job, right? It's absolutely it's incredibly common, right? And so if someone, some auditors might do a risk assessment when it's maybe not really that necessary. Some might not have done one or perhaps it would have been a really good idea. There is no rule. There is no moment when you have to do a risk assessment. It is a judgment-based decision. So it's actually perfectly fine for auditors to have different opinions on this. I don't actually have a problem with it. Um, and I would also say that, you know, you know, one of the things that we found is that of course, part of the decision does depend in part on whether the auditor has in-house risk assessment expertise or not. And many of them don't, right? Which again is perfectly fine. You know, not everyone has a acid, wait, um, an acid mine uh, drainage soil um, uh, expert in the house. So not everyone has an asbestos expert in the house. So it makes sense, but that is absolutely part of it. Before we move past me, um, back when, I was more involved with doing this stuff. It always there seemed to be a huge amount of importance in that attenuation number. So cracks in the concrete, likelihood of vapors entering a building, and then you do that risk assessment. And every everything hinged on one paper at that time, which you know it seems to me in your comment earlier about very conservative screening values that it was still hinging on that. So do you think that 
a primary I mean, source of research should be really nailing that down better? Look, the the assessment in the NEPM is based on that. The reality is there are plenty of ways, and risk assessors do this all the time, in which they refine that estimate. So that attenuation factor has been refined a million times. And right, looking at site-specific considerations of the shape of the building and the speed of the wind and the depth of the, like, all sorts of things, right? And so there is, you know, they can use modeling and they use other published values in the literature. There's a lot of, well, there's not that many techniques, but there's a few techniques that have been used to refine that attenuation factor. So the, the answer to your question is, really, the NEPM does use old conservative attenuation factors for chlorinated substances. And that's, a, that's as far as I'm concerned, a fact. And the reason for that is, there's many reasons for that, but one of them is because those values in the NEPM are meant to apply to just about any situation, right? And I think, and again, this is an opinion of my end, that there would be some scope to create you could easily create an HSL for a building that has a basement or of a, or of a sand. You could do one for one that has uh, no basement. You could do what you could. You absolutely could, right? It would be possible to do that. Perhaps at the time of the drafting of the NEPM, they wanted to stay within the four HILs categories and just leave it at that. And I think I can understand that decision. But the reality is it would be possible to create more um, standard situations or standard building structures and create uh, guideline values that are protective of those, that are perhaps less conservative. All right. Well, thanks for that answer. We're going to move to the early bird questions. For those of you who don't know, the early bird questions are those that come in before we start the talk. Um, I'll move to those now. So is our contaminated land industry a first world problem? Are we cleaning up sites that pose no acceptable risk? I, I love this question, actually, because it's it's actually a fascinating one. When I was in the EPA, I was asked the question maybe every day. Um, again, you're asking for an opinion here, so opinion is what you're going to get. I, I think that... First of all, it is a fact, yes, that the risk profile or the risk appetite around a hazard changes based on the jurisdiction, based on the community expectations, based on literally the country you're in, right? And I can tell you this for fact, because in the United States, for example, the acceptable cancer risk changes by a factor of either 100 or 1,000 between states. So, so in Hawaii, they'll accept one in a thousand, I think, and then in California, they accept one in a million, <laughs> right? I, mean, I think those numbers are right, but please don't quote me on those exact numbers. So that tells you something about how the risk appetite is a function of where you are. And in Australia, we have a certain risk appetite that you may agree or disagree with, but it does exist. Right, And it has been applied broadly and relatively evenly across the country. I'll also note that the risk appetite isn't always exactly the same even between environmental disciplines. So, for example, the risk appetite in air pollution and the risk appetite in soil, in contaminated land, might not be the same. So, and I'll give you, there is an obvious example. Anyone who looks at the, um, the NEPM guidelines for air um, those ones, you know, and I'm talking about, for example, the particulate ones and the ones for sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide. Those are not based on creating no impact. Those are based on a certain number of people being impacted, right? Which is quite different. It's actually based on an economic assessment of how many people can get sick. And it's all written in there. You can see it very, very clearly. Well, contaminated land is run on the principle of negligible impact, which basically means that it's approximate zero, right? And again, that's there is a lot of people who disagree with that, and I totally understand what they mean. Personally, I think that our risk framework is fair. It is in line with international standard. It is 
So it's not some crazy Australian invention. It is something that has been applied in just about every Western country. Um, and, uh, and it is applied quite consistently, I would say that as well. So, and I would also add one thing. There is a difference between contaminated land impacts and risks and the ones posed by some other environmental media. And this is something that I, I know people often don't think about. Contaminated land is there for a very long time, um, hundreds of years, maybe even thousands sometimes, well, some forever, <laughs> right? Well, you know, it, for the foreseeable future, that's what I mean by forever. So, so it makes sense for an extra level of conservativeness to apply. If you've got a puff of smoke, in a few minutes, it's going to go away. If you've got a contaminated site, in 100 years, it's still going to be there. And who knows what it's going to get used for, right? So we do our best to assess, of course, for the next intended use of land. But it makes sense to me to have an additional level of conservativeness in there to account to some extent for the fact that land... Crazy things happen with land. It gets redeveloped, it gets moved, all sorts of things happen. So there you go. That's my opinion on that. Right, Victor. Well, that's a very long opinion. If I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> going to have to you have to stay short and punchy with your opinions. But I will do that next time, I promise. Question number two. How far should the residential buildings be from a landfill? Oh, <laughs> well, that one's not really for me. It was not uh, what this research looked into. Every state has its own guidelines, right? So the buffer distances are defined from state to state. So I would not dare to set foot in that particular topic, partially because it's not really what this research was on. So that's saying look up the guidelines. Uh, question number three, what are the most urgent needs in this space and who is best placed to address them? Right. So I think, I honestly believe researchers, there is some work that needs to be done on better understanding certain not very sexy pollutants. That's one thing I believe that needs to be done. Um, a second one is, I think the reality is policymakers do have their finger on the pulse. And I say, just keep on doing that. Keep having your finger on the pulse. And, and you know, perhaps, you know, whenever there is a need to update or review the value, various screening levels, screening values. Of course, the, this research shows how important it is for those screening values to remain current, to remain up to date. It creates so much work and so much, it's, it creates so much trouble in so many ways in, to, to, to not have robust screen and current screening values. And to an extent, it also talks to planners I don't know how many planners are in the room, but this really, it tried to show you, you know, when you're looking at redevelopment of, of, of historical land, I hope what I presented today really showed that, you know, you know, historical uses of land do create a risk. And it is, it's not just an academic exercise. It's not box ticking. Not that I thought you thought that, but, you know, it is something very important to look at. And, and this research shows what are some of the land uses to really keep your eye on. Right. Question number four. I'm interested in implications of this research for planning systems reform. Well, that's I think I've answered it as much as I can already within within the previous one. Okay. Number five, are you seeing more biochar used in land remediation? Well, I mean, <laughs> it doesn't have much to do with what I did. But I'll answer it anyway. I've never seen biochar used in land remediation. There you go. But this is just me. If you're asking me for what I've seen, I've never seen it, which is not in any way saying whether it works or not, as good or it's bad. I just, it's just a luck of the draw. I happen to have never seen it. All right. Question six. Benzoapyrene use. Use CRC, Nepin, Canadian, SQG. Also is BAP. TEQ too sensitive and estimation for tier one criteria. Now, so okay, we'll, we'll, we won't go into this into too much detail. But one thing I'll say is um, that you know there is all there is the well known issues around the the 
benzoylpyrene value for ecosystems, which is not what we're talking about today. Today, we were looking at risks to human health, not the ecosystem ones, right? So I know that there was debate in the industry and there was, you know, industry associations discussed this at length of the various potential values that could have been used for the benzoylpyrene ecological value. I did, so yes, uh, for tier one for human health, um, I don't think it is too conservative. This is just my view on it. I think it is an appropriate value. And basically, um, benzopyrene really lends itself to risk assessment. The screening levels have to assume that the exposure is continuous over however many years, right? They have to, they have to assume that. And it is up to the risk assessor to say, hang on, no, this kid will only go to the school for at most six years. Therefore, the risk would be lower, right? When you're assessing a school. But the NEPM could never take that into account. That's just not possible for the NEPM to do, right? So I just thought I'd give you that example as a, perhaps a silly one, but it's something that's... Uh, so I think it is appropriate. Okay. Um, one for me. Is LDPE versus HDPE tubing for collection of samples analysed for PFAS? HDPE is typically considered better, and there is some US EPA guidance on that if you're wanting a reference for why to justify the extra expense of HDPE. Um, question number eight. What are the health risks associated with sanitary landfills that utilise cat sea soil for daily cover? All right, so cat sea soil, so this is a Victorian term really, so for others in the room, cat sea soil is soil that is, um, that includes a degree of contamination, right? It is not at the very high end, it is not at the clean end, it is somewhere sort of in between. So, I mean, of course the risk changes completely, but this is true of all exposure risks, it is always true based on the distance to the nearby receptors, based on the use of the land, based on, you know, find its use for the cap, how long is it going to be before the cap actually gets remediated and closed down? Of course, it is related to how much pollution is present in the cat sea soil, because cat sea is a range. So, you know, I would never be able to tell you, just like this off the top of my head, cat sea soil for capping material is fine or not fine right? Because it's not as simple as that, right? Cat sea soil contains a degree of pollution. That's the definition of cat category C soil. How can that pollution leave the landfill, right? It can leave through leaching. It can leave through wind-blown dust. How much will really be carried in that wind-blown dust? Is it a reasonable amount? Those are the sort of things. So I'm sorry, I know it seems like I'm dodging the question, but the reality is you know, this is always true. It, it, just having a scenario, risks never exist on their own. This is an absolute truth in our field. The thing on its own, a, a cigarette doesn't create a risk unless someone smokes it, <laughs> right? So it's just, that's just the way it works. So it, it's, I just thought I'd elaborate on that just because this will be true of a lot of scenarios in a lot of people's heads. All right, this one I know is one of your favourites. Uh, number nine, hemp cleanup, an agri-growth industry or hemp to hydrogen? I have to be honest, I did not understand. The, I, I, it's not it's not related to what I did, so obviously I know absolutely nothing about it. And I actually would love, I have to be honest, I read it and I was like, I, I want to know more about this. <laughs> but unfortunately, I, I this, is, this is not what this work was on or anything I've ever worked on. So perhaps Once I looked into the use of hemp for phytoremediation, and that was fascinating. But um, well, maybe that's the emphasis of the question. Yeah. Well, we couldn't use it at the university because there was a concern that students would break into the glass houses and steal it. Right. This is—I'm not even joking. That was the concern at the time. <laughs> so, so I was not allowed to do that research. That's holding up good research there, by the sounds of it. All right, so. Uh, perhaps the person who posted that question could send us a few more details in the Q&A. All right, we're now moving to the Q&A section. So thanks for all those early bird questions. All right, so Ron Blank 
back and forth. What about PFAS? Okay, I think you've answered that one already. And pesticides. I know. Pesticides. Isn't it fascinating? Not a blip on the radar. <laughs> I thought uh, fascinating. Thank you. Whoever asked that. Um, I don't know, if, Ron, if it's still you. A brilliant question and very good. I, I like when people can spot the gap. Um, I thought it was a fascinating finding in itself. So much research on the toxicity of pesticides. So much work on deriving all these criteria for pesticides. And no one ever finds them anywhere. Um, that's basically what it's finding. And they certainly do not get, or they certainly, they almost never get found at levels that exceed the guideline values, the screening guideline values. The screening guideline values for pesticides are really quite robust, right? I would say, I, I, again, in my judgment, I would say they're very, very strong values. And, um, and it is fascinating to me that Look, even when I worked in Contam land, I think I might have had one detect of one pesticide once. It's they're rare. Finding them is rare, and finding them at levels that exceed um, levels that are safe for human beings is very, very rare. Could I say, and I, I do want to say this, this is because this is outside of the research, but I think it's important, is really let's let's maintain the focus. For, so for today, let's not forget that the work that I did was on risk to human health. Pesticides, when you look at them, it's primarily an ecological risk, which the work I did couldn't look at, right? It was just not possible. It would have, it would have blown it out of proportions, right? It was, it was hard enough as it was, right? But so, you know, I know for a fact that, you know, pesticides are present in, in rural waterways and they're often present. You know, th this data is freely available. Um, are, are present at levels that might may well be causing an impact to, impact to the ecosystem. So let's not mix those two things. Humans are much more resistant to pesticides than, than um, the receiving environment. And that's not a coincidence. Pesticides were designed to be toxic to certain insects, and they were designed to not be toxic to humans. So it's not surprising, <laughs> right? Or not be as toxic to humans. All right, well, that's, that is an interesting observation. Did you distinguish between 53V and 53X audits when assessing the results? No, I did not, right? Um, the reason was, uh, for anyone in the room, the difference who's not from Victoria, those two different audits, the X audits or the 53X are the contaminated land audits that in Victoria used to be done it's the, the framework's changed now. They used to be done specifically for an assessment of contaminated land. It's not quite the right legal description, but you know what I mean. And the 53 Vs were more facilities audits, right? That often just included an element of contaminated land, but they often were about lots of other things. And they were often specifically for landfills rather than for contaminated land. So no, I did not separate between the two because ultimately, um, there were not that many 53 Vs that included a health risk assessment related to contaminated land specifically. So it was, it would have been a handful. And uh, and when they were done, as far as I was concerned, they were just a content land risk assessment. At the end of the day, it's soil, it's water, it's vapor, there is a receptor. So that was the way it worked. So no, I did not tease them out specifically. All right, and now Ron, who asked the question about pesticides, uh, is extrapolating to say in agriculture, e.g. oversprays and found on foods and water. So I think you've answered that question, really. Yes, I will say one thing, though. When it comes to food, you know, and I hope everyone here, oh, maybe people don't know this, but, you know, food is regulated in a very specific way. Right. And auditors have a, walk a very fine line when it comes to food. You know, they do not look at the buildup of pesticides in food grown on a site, and like grown on a commercial site. Right. They will look at veggies you've grown in your backyard. Right. And there is there is a fine line there. And the jurisdictional boundary is quite strong. And it's a very important one to separate. I, I won't go into it now because it is, and I would get it wrong, to be honest with you, but it is it is quite a complex division 
between the pesticides that you'd find in your backyard and you grow in your, with your veggie patch and how those are regulated, which is normally by the environmental regulator locally, or um, the the um, the food that is that you buy in your supermarkets, which is normally regulated by health departments. So it's actually done in quite a different framework. So at risk of getting slightly off track, the wastewater reuse and the criteria that are set for treatment of that prior to irrigation, do you think that poses more of a risk or less of a risk than, say, contaminated land? <laughs> oh, God. Um, let me think. Let me think. I wish I could tell you that I know the ins and outs of the water reuse guideline. That's my problem. Because I know, what I do know is that well, I have faith in the fact that a lot of assessments went into the rising values that would be protected, right? And that that I was quite, um, I'm quite comfortable with that statement. As to comparing these two things, oh, God. We'll, we'll take it There's on. There's a difference between <laughs> those two things because contaminated land is this broad framework of assessment. Well, like, which I feel like it's a lot bigger. I, so I don't think it's quite an apples for apples comparison, if I may. But uh, but no, I would not be able to pick a favourite between those two, if you will. No, I wouldn't be able to do that. No worries, Victor. I wouldn't have either. Um, there's a question relating to your presentation slide. Should not the frequency be 1% to 5% instead of not to 5% in the table of chemicals of potential concern. Oh, <laughs> it, okay, I love it. <laughs> it should be greater than not to five. That's what it actually should be, right? Because technically it could be 0 0.000001. That is correct. Um, so you are right. It, zero to five is misleading, but one to five would not have worked because what about zero point five percent? Um, so there you go. But yes, this made it into the paper, so, <laughs> so let's hope no one else uh, finds it here. Uh, it's <laughs> but my there. goodness, I'm impressed with that comment though. Like whoever whoever pointed that Margaret, out, Margaret, good attention to detail. Gold, gold star to Margaret. One hundred percent. All right. <laughs> Next question from Ruth Davies. Hi, Victor. My team in Environment Protection Branch of DEECA is currently working on planning policy reform related to contaminated land. I'd love to have an offline chat with you about how we could use your research. Well, there you go. Well, I'd love to. And of course, I know Ruth well from years of working together. So nice to see you, Ruth. And yes, more than happy to chat. And my paper is available online free of charge. I know I've said it before, but just in case, it is it is there. All right, next one from an anonymous attendee. Service Aww. stations are very ubiquitous and also quite strictly regulated. So likely to have more audits associated. Would this have an impact or skew the data? Absolutely. The answer is absolutely yes. Remember when I said this is not a clean data set? That is exactly what I meant. And uh, anonymous person, it's a very good person, a uh, very good person, very good point that you raised. And I'll give you an example of another one that is the other way around, which is, did you notice how little mining was in there? Um, and there is, oh, there's not that much. And the reason was because mining normally, mine sites are not, um, restored into house into suburbs, right? You don't build a suburb on an old mine, right? Normally it gets restored to a natural ecosystem or some kind of mine rehabilitation. So can you see how that's another example of an equal and opposite effect of something that is actually perhaps underrepresented in here? In because because it just you almost it's very rare to do an audit of an old mine site. Very rare, pretty rare. Um, because normally it doesn't get redeveloped for residential use. So yes, you're absolutely right. And so this data is skewed in many ways. <laughs> right? Let me be clear about this. There is a lot of ways in which it's skewed, which is why you may have noticed I never said this is definitely that, <laughs> right? It's 
but what this does, this data, I think the what makes this data interesting is that it's skewed by a million factors that are all real, right? And they're all happening right now. So it actually tells us a lot about what our machine, the quantum land machine that exists in Victoria, what it spits out. Right. And for example, an overrepresentation of service stations is totally part of it. <laughs> right. Because no one will ever forget to do an audit. The council person who decides that whether the redevelopment of a service station requires an audit or not, they will never get that wrong. But with some of the other land uses, perhaps, you know, you know, we've all seen at times where perhaps something should have been audited and maybe it wasn't. Right. But we know service stations front of mind always gets audited. So you're absolutely right. All right, next question is from Greg Neild. Was there an analysis on the medium that triggered the health, human health risk assessment, therefore vapour versus soil versus groundwater? So, Neil, the answer is no, and I absolutely wanted to do it desperately. The reason it couldn't be done was because the risk assessments risk assessors, some of them report separately the risk for each medium, but others don't, right? And so it was. It would have been a nightmare for 370 odd risk assessments to try and dissect it. And the reason I know this is because initially I tried, <laughs> right? And I got, on the second assessment, I gave up and I said, nah, that's it. We're just looking at the overall one. However, I think there is one thing that is significant and worth noting which is if you look at the table of pollutants, right, and the ones that get assessed more often, you will see that there is a strong, and I, I wanted to say this and I forgot to say, there is a strong over-representation in the top rows of volatile substances. And that is not a coincidence, right? That is because they are the ones for which vapor intrusion and inhalation is the exposure pathway, right? So the reality is, even without having explicitly done the assessment of splitting the risk factors individually for each medium, which frankly would have been fascinating, right? And I, anyway, but I would still be doing it now. So, you know, um, it's still implicitly, it is possible to infer that vapor intrusion is by far, by far the strongest, though the most frequent in terms of the one triggering the need for a risk assessment and uh, causing the selection of a pollutant to be required as part of that risk assessment. And just, I'll tell you again, because you don't have that slide in front of you, you know, in your top 10, 20, you know, whatever it is in those, those top categories, you know, you've got benzene, naphthalene, ethyl benzene, toluene, xylenes, all the dichloroethanes, you've got the, uh, the PC viral chloride, right? It cannot be a coincidence that it is always these highly volatile substances. The only non-volatile in the top three categories was benzopyrene. In the top two categories was benzopyrene. And why is that? For all the reasons we talked about earlier. Right. But they're not really overrepresented. It's just a practical consideration. Like if oh, They just happen a lot. They got, get assessed a lot. That's what it is. They get assessed a lot. And what does that tell you? That tells you that someone more often thought that they posed enough of a concern to warrant the risk assessment. Victor, I'm just wondering, like, you know how we have these groups of analytes in certain, you know, from the lab, like it used to be a US EPA screen, I'm not sure what it's called these days. I mean, effectively, that's becoming a quasi list of what we think of as priority contaminants because the consultant only has so much to choose from and, they will choose that. So is that not skewing a whole lot of this as well? Absolutely. And I'll give you, look, the, the ultimate example of that for me is dioxins, right? That's just for me is it, because, you know, you would only ever analyze for dioxins in soil or water, it doesn't really matter, if you were pretty damn sure that there was a source of dioxin, a significant source of dioxins on the site. The reason being, so let me let me paint a picture for anyone in the room who perhaps is not that familiar with this. So dioxins, at least in the past, and I'm sure it's still true now, very expensive to analyze, right? It used to be $800 or $1,000 a pop, $800 if you send them to Germany, right? It used to be a big deal, right? Maybe it's still the case now, I don't know. 
Um, so that's it's an expensive analysis for one sample, right? Um, for a pollutant that's everywhere, right? Because dioxins are literally everywhere because they're atmospheric, they occur through atmospheric deposition, right? So you will always find something and they're analyzed to nanogram or picogram levels. So you will always get the ticks, um, almost always get the ticks for a polluter that doesn't have a screening level. So you've got the trifecta here of something that is ridiculously expensive to analyze, um, that, um, that occurs absolutely everywhere and that you don't have a screening level for, <laughs> right? So basically, if I were to just be an eager beaver and go out to the and sample, automatically I've created this whole piece of work where I have to do a risk assessment because there is no guideline value because, you know, I've done that automatically just because I collected the sample. And that is regardless of the risk it poses. As toxic as, di as toxic as dioxins are, which they are, the reality is they are absolutely everywhere in very, very small amounts. So the principle of dose response applies to them like it applies to everything else. You still need to be exposed to enough to actually trigger an effect. So... So that tells you something about um, biases, analytical biases that occurred because of the pragmatic pragmatic um, considerations that the consultant would have in that moment. So Richard, I know it was a little bit different from what you said, but it's an example of how, yes, you know, we'll get a suite that has a pollutant in there or doesn't. You know, when we do our phthalate suite, which we'll do once in three years, if you are a good consultant, we'll still, you know, that it's very, very rare you only analyze for those phthalates that are quite common, right? So all of this is, you know, these are, you know, I've just thought it's worth pointing out, right, that these are analyses that, that, that basically the pragmatics of the analysis do drive the outcome to some extent. We better go back to these questions, otherwise David and Thomas will get upset. So <laughs> David Bassetto, how can we determine the contamination of water or waterways or stream and rivers from arsenic and other chemicals from a gold mining tailings dump? How long will it take the river to recover or rehabilitate? Wow, that is a fantastic <laughs> question and a very important one. It's an important question. So, and of course, and I'm sorry to do this too, but you know I will not be able to give the answer to something like this. I wish, I wish it would be possible to just say, it. but so the reality is, um, I know I know a couple of things on that front that you know from my days at EPA, I know that the EPA has published in Victoria, but I know in various states the regulators have published data on metal. Um, on heavy metal concentrations in streams as a result of mining activities. So I would recommend that you have, I don't know what state you're in, um, but um, but I would recommend that you go look at the local environment regulators website, depending on where you are, they may or may not have done it. Um, academics have done a ton of this work, right? Academics love taking samples of water near mine sites. I'm joking, but like it happens relatively often. Um, there's lots of studies on that. So, you know, so that's another place where that information can be found. In terms of literally collecting a sample, I mean, there's a lot of methods and, you know, I would not go into the details of how one collects a water sample from a river. But, um, but you know, you know, obviously consultants have certain methods that they use that are extremely rigorous because that's what they have to do. But, um, you know, but there is... The reality is there is methods out there and it's not really that that hard if you want to collect just a, quite a simple sample that can be done. Um, and uh, in terms of how long does it take a river to clean itself, that is an impossible question to answer as a general one because that changes from river to river, right? You're in a tropical environment that gets the monsoons, the river gets flushed out every every year. If you are in a drier environment, you know, it, it changes completely, right? So the reality, and of course, is it a little creek? Is, is it an ephemeral creek that only runs for a few weeks a year? Is it a is it the Murray, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Completely different situations. So the reality is rivers do flush themselves out over a period of time. That absolutely is the case, and that absolutely does happen. Um, do they flush themselves out perfectly? It takes a while. And it can take, depending on the type of pollution, it can take a, even a long while. Um, but it's something, so you understand, I just thought 
I won't be able to give you the answer in terms of how many years, but I thought what I'd do is just tell you what are the factors that decide how long it might take. So I'm sorry, I know the answer is not quite an answer, but at least it's partially there. Yeah, had a good go at it. Um, <laughs> next question from Thomas Lancaster. Do you think with the possibility of establishing guidelines for microplastics and other emerging contaminants, there is likely to be a sharp increase in the number of human health risk assessments conducted for these that COPCS. COPCS, chemicals of potential concern. Yeah. In the next decade, can we utilise the data you have presented to help inform future regulation for these emerging contaminants? That's a good question. It's an excellent question, Thomas. I, um, so... We could talk about it for an hour over a glass of cognac, but the reality <laughs> is, so um, the answer is yes. Having a greater awareness of more pollutants will create more risk assessments. And I think that's a fact. And actually, it's a demonstrable effect because any risk assessor in the room would tell me that they've done a ton of risk assessments on PFAS since the emergence of PFAS after the piece of work that I did. So as other pollutants emerge, we could expect a similar pattern to occur, right? So I've spoken to so many risk assessors out there and now basically all they do is PFAS, right? So you know, I'm exaggerating, sorry, please. <laughs> but I just realized they should be careful not to embellish too much. Um, but of course that would happen as other pollutants emerge in our awareness, regardless of whether there is a guideline or not as they emerge in our awareness, then of course there would be a greater awareness that the analysis exists. So responding to what Richard said earlier, there is more analysis available. We analyze for it more, we find it more. There is a greater awareness, I think, to look for it more. So I will assess it more often. Um, there also, also, and I think it's worth noting, and this is, people complain about it, but it's natural and normal. When it comes to emerging contaminants, um, screening criteria that are developed for emerging contaminants, so that's what you were talking about, you know, when they develop guideline values. At the start, they are always very conservative because at the start, there is always very little research, right? So, you know, by definition, whenever there is greater uncertainty, you have to be more conservative. That's an absolute truth in the environmental sciences, right? And so as emerging contaminants come up, you know, when they will come up with a guideline value for triclosan or for some obscure, for some of the phthalates and things like this, which I suspect is going to happen, it makes sense to me that they are going to derive guidelines that are quite conservative because by definition, emerging contaminants are not as well understood, right? And so what does that mean? More conservative guidelines mean more risk assessments, <laughs> right? So there you go. See, I hope you can understand the, the pattern there. Uh, last question from me, and thanks very much for all those Q&A questions. That was excellent. Um, do you think we're kidding ourselves just in terms of um, looking at, say, compound-specific risk assessments uh, and really not even trying to look at, say, the additive effects of multiple compounds at the same time and trying to work out the impacts on human health. Is, are we not better to go with some broader, cumbersome indicator and just say, well, that's it? Because there's so many emerging contaminants that I can't imagine they're going to keep up. And there's, you know so many permutations and combinations of additive effects, are we not better off to come up with a different way of... So, indicators? I mean, there's entire conferences on just this topic, so, you know, we'll keep it short. And, um, and I would ask you to have a chat to anyone in air quality about this. You want to talk about mixtures of, you know, pollution mixtures, speak to an air quality expert and you will see them weep, <laughs> right? Because that's when you truly, truly, truly get mixtures, right? Of course you get mixtures in quantum land of water. Of course you do. But the reality is in this context of quantum land, it is common that there is one or two or three or 
five key pollutants on a site that are the ones that are driving the majority of the risk. Is this absolutely always true? No, absolutely not, but it is often true. So I would say, so the framework we have actually often works quite well from that perspective. So as a starting point, it already has that. Second, you know, many attempts are being made in the scientific literature right now to try and come up with uh, assessments for chemical mixtures. And, you know, the reality is at the moment, there is no system that is better than the one we have right now. Um, you know, and the one we have right now is very conservative because what it does is at a, at a, um, or adequately conservative, depending on how you want to look at it. Because the system we have now basically says, pick the pollutants that are the key ones. Don't just pick everything, pick the key ones, assess the risk from them. And in the risk assessment, you, you add them to each other. You assume that each of them just has an additive effect. It is quite rare for pollutants to have synergistic effects where the sum of the parts is, you know, where the sum is greater than, you know, than each individually uh, combined, right? So that's really quite rare. So it is considered to be adequately conservative. And also it is just the risk framework we have right now. Sometimes you just got to work with the framework you have. I, I, while I will not share the, Richard, if you don't mind me saying, slightly defeatist tone of your question, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I might not share that, but I do share that there is a need for more work on, the reality is chemical mixtures are the future, right? That's just the way our industry is going to go. So, and that's a fact. I know this, I, this is because you look at what's happening in Europe and the US and they're already moving in that direction, looking at more at chemical mixtures and that sort of thing. So it is what's going to happen. Our industry is absolutely going to change and have more of it. So basically the researchers got to be researching, the policy makers got to keep their finger on that pulse because once the research reaches its critical, not critical mass, it reaches that burden of evidence that is adequate to have a new method that gets used, then it's up to the policymakers to make sure that it gets implemented in the industry. Thanks very much, Victor. So we're well over time and really appreciate your extra time. Um, and many thanks to everyone who's stayed on. It's fantastic to see so many. So just really big thanks to Victor Kabai for his great presentation. Thank you very much, everyone. It was an absolute pleasure being here. And can I just say wonderful questions? I really enjoyed them. So thank you very much. Thanks, Victor.